But AI is different. AI is the first technology that can make decisions by itself. AI can make decisions about its own usage. It can also make decisions about our, about our lives. Increasingly, when we apply for a loan to a bank or we apply to a job or whatever, it's an AI making the decisions about us. So the big danger we are facing is that humans might lose control of the future with their own creation, which will turn out to be far more powerful than we are. Actually, you can't even be sure if what I'm saying right now and the images you now see on, 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 on the screen, maybe it's not me, maybe it's an AI, maybe it's a fake video. What would it mean for AI to gain mastery of language and with this potential mastery of politics, economics, religion? Maybe we'll see religions based on holy books written by a non-human intelligence. Now, there are so many different possibilities there, and we just need time to understand what we are facing and how to deal with it. Hi, welcome back to Innovative Minds. I'm your host, T+. Here with me are Yuval Noah Harari and Audrey Tang. We previously explored how artificial intelligence will most likely impact humanity and modern democratic systems. Now let's dig deeper into the topic. In terms of political spectrum, Harari, you are a strong advocate of liberalism because you believe that it has proven itself to be superior to all alternatives so far. However, you have cast doubts on the data processing speed and capability of modern liberal institutions, indicating the lack of such capability could ultimately lead to a shift of authority from humans to networked algorithms. Does your position remain? Again, it's not a prophecy, it's just a warning. It could happen. And liberalism is based on the belief in the agency of individuals. And what I just described is a means to destroy the agency of individuals. And if you know how to hack people, if you know how to manipulate them, even on the level of creating these kinds of intimate relationships with them, then this destroys the foundation of any liberal society. Authoritarian societies, dictatorships, will be able to flourish in this situation. You know, for a dictator, the best thing in the world is to break relations between people. The greatest danger for any dictator is when people trust each other, because then they can organize themselves against him. But if people can't organize themselves, if people don't trust each other, this is kind of, of a greenhouse for, for dictatorships. Um, so I'm not saying that it is inevitable that AI will hack human beings, will destroy relationships between human beings and destroy liberalism. But it's a very big danger and we need to take action now in order to prevent it. Audrey, do you think that AI will help governments to address the challenges of the 21st century? Yeah, um, I think the key, uh, and I quote from what you all said to me uh, three years ago, the key is to create stories that can serve us without being enslaved uh, by those stories. Uh, I think a key part of democracy is to make sure that the kind of stories uh, that offers the antidotes, like when people listen to those stories, they understand that it's not the only way for, for example, the social media to lead to polarization. There are many people who participate in projects, for example, the Community Note volunteers on Twitter, who also work with a sort of AI, although the algorithm is open, uh, to compete, not to polarize, but rather to depolarize, to find the kind of story that when someone uh, gets outraged by a certain tweet, immediately by reading that community note, the outrage is taken away and make way for uh, instead uh, recontextualization to understand a fuller picture of what is going on. And a key insight in the community note algorithm was that we need to find the bridge makers, the people who make the stories and the stories make sense to people on 
both sides of polarization. And once we can give the platform the visibility to those bridge making stories, then people after reading those stories, uh, re engage as democratic citizens in a more constructive mode. So I would argue that there are also certain kind of assistive intelligence that are pro social in social media mm -hmm. in uh, fostering uh, the human flourishing by associating together to form meaningful organization links only if we can systematically give more visibility to the bridge making stories rather than the polarizing stories. It's good to hear about cases where AI can help appease public debate. Audrey, could you tell us more about how the Taiwanese government has been using a platform like Polis to make itself more accessible to citizens? Yeah, uh, so it was kind of a precursor to the community notes that I just mentioned. Uh, in fact, Polis influenced directly the design of the Twitter community notes. In 2015, we were also facing a onslaught of a kind of AI called UberX, right? It's a kind of AI that reliably dispatches somebody close to you to pick you up and charge you for it. And they say that it's not a taxi service, it's just a AI that helps the riders uh, and the um, drivers uh, to find each other. Uh, but the entire society, of course, was quite polarized in 2015. There are people who think, oh, this is the uh, beginning of this sharing economy uh, platform era. But there are also people who say that, no, this is a way for algorithm to exploit people so that they become interchangeable parts in the gig economy and so on. Uh, so we deployed the Polis uh, tool to bring together the people who are on both sides of polarization to share their experiences and find out the shared common values hidden in plain sight. For example, people all agree, actually, that it's okay to have surge pricing, but not undercutting existing meters, because that would be unfair to the labor condition. That they should also serve the rural areas and empower the co-ops locally, not just serve the urban area where it's profitable, that insurance is important, and so on. So once people actually saw everybody agree with each other most of the ideas most of the time they do not get distracted endlessly on those one or two polarized topics but can actually very quickly uh, form the rough consensus which end up becoming you know uber becoming the q taxi fleet but also the local co-ops and social entrepreneurs can also enjoy search pricing and at best dispatch so it turns a zero sum or negative sum game into a positive sum one by engaging a high higher bit rate of co-creation. So it is deliberative democracy, but also at scale. In October 2022, the White House released the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. This non-binding text lists five principles that safeguard AI users' freedoms, including the right to be protected from unsafe or ineffective systems. Is this a step in the right direction? No, it's, it's a very positive step. And of course, you know, any attempt to deal with a very complex issue so you have different suggestions, you try something, maybe, maybe it, it doesn't work so well, you try something else. It's a process. It's not like we have these fixed principles and, and that's it, we solve the problem. I would like though to point out one very significant element, which is that we need to think beyond the level of a single country. We need to think beyond the level of a specific democracy even. Uh, the question is often global because we see global immense disparities in, in power between different parts of the globe. One of the biggest dangers with AI is that this technology is being developed by a very small number of countries. The United States and China are, of course, the two big ones. Then you have maybe half a dozen or a dozen additional countries which are important. And most countries are not, not really in the game. They are affected, of course, by the technology, but they, don't, they are not the ones leading the AI revolution. And there is a very big danger that what happened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution will again happen in the 21st century with the AI revolution. That the few countries who develop the technology will have the power to dominate, exploit, maybe even conquer all the rest. In the 19th century, to, to the, the control a country, you needed to send the soldiers in, to send an army in. In the 21st century, increasingly to, to dominate a country, you don't need to send the soldiers in, you just need to take the data out. If you uh, uh, have all the information 
on every politician, every judge, every military officer, every citizen in some small country in, 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 in a part of the world, um, you can control it from a distance. And also economically, if the immense wealth generated by AI will make a few rich countries even richer, while undermining the economies of much of the world, this again, it's a huge, huge danger. And when we think about AI, yes, we have to focus on questions like the ones you, you mentioned in this document of how to protect the citizens of an individual democracy. But we always also need to have a plan for how to protect humanity as a whole from such dangerous developments like an increase in global inequality. What are your thoughts? Audrey? Yeah, definitely uh, everything you've all said. <laughs> and I would also uh, add one thing. Um, I think uh, the current generation of language models uh, show a possibility actually for linguistic communities around the world uh, to equalize the playing field of their local knowledge, their local language and so on, if they're given uh, the kind of rights as language communities to collectively determine what goes into the language model, how the language model is used, and whether the language model enhances their cultural norms or destroys mm. uh, their cultural norms. I totally agree that countries are maybe not the best abstractions to think about this, just like uh, we mentioned the pandemic or ozone or uh, anything that is truly global in nature probably should not be ruled on a country boundary. Uh, but language models uh, or social cultural constructs that are based on linguistic boundaries, that are actually a pretty good uh, abstraction. Yeah. Uh, we've already seen, for example, uh, people in Iceland uh, taking a hold of their own uh, language represented in the open AI language models through an early uh, partnership. And now here in Taiwan, because we have 20 national languages, uh, some Austronesian, some based on kanji, and including the Taiwan sign language, we're also investing a lot to make sure that the language communities in Taiwan uh, gets the kind of honor and dignity in their culture uh, with the language models instead of everybody now suddenly having to learn perfect language. Mandarin or English or other dominating languages. So I would advise thinking along the linguistic and cultural boundaries more compared to the jurisdictional boundaries. Now I want to talk about AI ethics. Professor Harari, you offer a thought-provoking perspective on the direction of history. You believe that there is absolutely no proof that human well-being improves as history rolls along. Building on top of that, what kind of AI ethics could avail us a better future? Uh, first and foremost, to remember that ethics is ultimately about suffering. That morality doesn't mean obeying the laws of some god. Morality doesn't mean obeying the laws of some government. Morality simply means helping uh, liberate sentient beings from suffering. This is morality. It's not always easy, because sometimes the same action uh, uh, protects some people or some beings from suffering, but could cause a certain amount of su suffering to others. So we saw during, during the pandemic, you need to put people in lockdown. Of course, they are not happy about it. It's not pleasant. It it's, it's, it's could be quite miserable to be in lockdown. But you need it to protect people from worse suffering, like dying from a disease. So there are, oh, oh, it, it's very, of course, complicated to weigh these things one against the other. But all these ethical arguments are ultimately in terms of suffering. This will cause some suffering to that person, but will liberate that person from, uh, from, from a certain danger. And we need to keep this in mind when we come to deal with AI also. It should, ultimately, the discussion should be about uh, uh, suffering and liberation from suffering. And we should also remember that, as far as we know, AI itself cannot suffer. It has no, as far as we know, it has no consciousness, it has no feelings, it can't feel pain or pleasure or love or fear. So it's a tool that could have a huge impact on sentient beings, but it is not sentient itself. 
Of course, the whole discussion will completely change if and when AI becomes conscious and uh, becomes an ethical agent and an ethical subject that can also itself suffer or be happy. And I think this is maybe the, the, the biggest unknown about the whole field of AI is whether AI is anywhere on the road to developing consciousness or not, and how would we know? Um, there are huge debates about it, uh, uh, but th th there are no easy answers. Uh, but we, all the time, whenever we talk about ethics, we need to remember that it's really a discussion about suffering. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when we say AI is assistive, at least, at the very least, uh, it needs to be harmless, uh, helpful, mm. and honest. Uh, honest being the most important to me because it's easy actually to evaluate whether it causes uh, toxicity, like immediate harm, uh, or whether it's uh, being helpful or actually misleading people and so on. Uh, but honesty uh, is difficult to measure because whether something is truthful or not depends on context. And AI gets used in all sorts of different contexts in which honesty uh, is gauged differently uh, by different communities. And so I, I think really to um, alleviate suffering, we need to delegate the kind of uh, alignment, like the social norms around what counts as honest and also harmless and also helpful to the particular communities that deploy the sort of AI to help such communities. Uh, there's probably no one-size-fits-all um, measurement yes. evaluation when it comes to honesty. Uh, and uh, I would also argue that even on harmless and helpfulness, uh, there's also community differences uh, across the world. So the more that we delegate to the people closest to the suffering, these kind of evaluations, and for those evaluations to meaningfully affect the uh, constitution of that particular AI instance that they're deploying, the more we resemble this old personal computing for community infrastructure point of view that can empower particular communities. So that is actually the direction we're taking in making sure that the democratization of AI use is in the hands of the citizens. And once we do so, one benefit is that more and more people will come to understand uh, the AI system systems and make um, contributions on how to understand the levels of intelligence or even eventual consciousness of such systems. And once we are armed with that kind of insights uh, in AI evaluation and safety and so on, then we can more, um, with more confidence say, okay, research should go this way because this will not accidentally create conscious but misaligned beings. And research should instead go this way because we understand those guardrails better better now. Knowledge and citizen empowerment will be the key to successful integration of AI into our lives. Expanding upon that, I want to ask, how can we make sense of our lives in face of the acceleration of history? So it's just that as things move, move faster, it's more difficult to make sense of what is happening. And when you no longer are able to make sense of what is happening, you lose your agency. As a citizen, if you, if you, if you, if you can't do that, if you can't just make sense of reality, then you don't know what to do, and then you expect some authority figure. It could be traditionally a human being, like a big political leader, a dictator. They can make sense. They will decide for me. Or you expect the technology, okay, the AI will make sense for me. Like you'll ask GPT, uh, uh, chat GPT or GPT-4, please explain to me what is happening and what should I do, and increasingly just follow its, uh, uh, its way of, of viewing the world. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think a lot of our work during the pandemic, politically speaking, is just to continue to make sense every day. Uh, and not by the government publishing the numbers, but by the government amplifying the part of civil society, of journalists, of civic technologists, of the local organizers, and so on, that managed to make some local sense. And then our government on a national scale just magnify whatever sense that is being made on those local scale and empower them because they're closest uh, to the suffering. Uh, and I increasingly think uh, 
that is really the only way uh, to uh, keep the, the corridor, the very narrow corridor uh, between state overreach on one side and state doing nothing and chaos on the other side is just to ensure that people who manage to still make some sense on a local scale gets all the resources they need to broadcast their new ideas, uh, which make sense of the new situation, the latest coronavirus variant, the latest infodemic variant, the latest interactive defects. If somebody started to make sense and say, aha, I understand the root cause of this, we need to find somebody out and give them all the platform and make sure that the entire country, you know, the entire democracy world uh, learns about those ideas. Hmm. I see. It's all about proper allocation of social resources. On another note, Yuval, do you believe it's possible to envision a non-biased AI? You know, th th this was a dream or an, an assumption in the beginning that, okay, humans have biases because we are these messy biological creatures with our psychology and childhood. But AI, this is pure mathematics. Mathematics don't have biases. It will be okay. And now we know this was wishful thinking, that mathematics have biases, and even AI has a childhood. One of the chief sources of bias in AI is their childhood, which is the period when they are trained on a certain database. The same way that we as children, we are trained on a certain database of words and stories and encounters. It's the same with AI. And if we hear a lot of racist uh, um, things when we are young, uh, it, it creates a racist bias in us. It's exactly the same thing with an AI. You train an AI on a racist bias, you get a racist AI. So <laughs> in this way, it's not so different from us. Of course, we want to reach the point that uh, we uh, uh, create an unbiased AI just as we want to create unbiased people, but it's, it's probably equally, pro equally difficult to, to, do, to do it with AI as it is with human beings, because there is no such thing as a completely unbiased data set. Audrey, what kind of assessments has your office made to protect citizens from AI-based discrimination? Uh, of course, to name and surface the harm and seek immediate uh, redress, that is the most important thing. But I would also say that we want uh, AI systems to have a bias uh, for um, harmlessness mm. against harm. We want them to bias yeah. for helpfulness against, uh, you know, toxicity. We want them to uh, have a bias to be more honest, to prefer integrity uh, over telling lies and making things up. These are not often uh, thought of as biases, but these are biases because in the raw training data, there's a lot of toxicity and dishonesty uh, and just uh, the ideas of like random writings on the internet will all exhibit uh, pro-social behavior. That is, of course, not true. We already know it's not true. So there is a part of the alignment, that is to say, bringing those raw AI system, especially language models, to the community norm that we should really focus on. And so uh, in the National Institute of Cybersecurity, which I also had, we're now working to make evaluations and certifications of AI systems that are willing. Uh, of course, they are not subjects. They're makers that are willing to go through this kind of inspection on the raw data collection, on the uh, reinforcement training to fit the human norm, uh, the continual evaluation, including so-called red teaming, like people deliberately trying to trick the language model to say something uh, that is not meant by its makers and the society, and only when they survive uh, and pass all those certification and exams, uh, being a good uh, assistive member to the society, do we uh, then give a certificate to say, okay, this language model is good to use to uh, translation on, under these criteria, and if you find anything wrong, here are the ways to seek redress and correct its behavior. Considering honesty as a desirable bias is enlightening. Yuval, in what way do Audrey's comments inspire you? In, in, in many ways. I mean, it shows, as a historian, my tendency is to focus on the negative scenarios, uh, to warn people about them. It uh, makes me very hopeful to hear somebody in a position of power, a senior politician, that uh, has a, such a deep grasp 
of the, not just the dangers we are facing, but also of the positive ways that can, we can address these problems and, and, and fix them. And I think more generally, it's just um, so good to see, um, again, somebody senior in politics who has such a deep grasp of the technological developments which are perhaps the most important developments in the world now. You know, so many politicians that they have a lot of power, but they don't have this kind of deep understanding. And they are often focusing on the wrong issues. Um, and, and another thing is that, you know, so many people who have the deep understanding of the technology, they don't go to politics. They understand AI, so they say, wonderful, I'll, I'll, I'll do my startup and I'll make billions out of it. It's, it's rare to see somebody who says, I, I have a deep understanding of AI, I'll go to politics in order to make sure that uh, the, the uh, proper regulations, that uh, uh, the AI is used for the benefit of society. And I hope that Audrey will be an inspiration for uh, many other people uh, uh, in the tech world or coming out of the tech industry to also think about going into politics because ultimately, again, as we said in the beginning, all, every technology can be used for good or for bad. The people who make the technology, they can't decide in the end how it will be used. It, in the end, it's always a political decision. So we need good and committed politicians who understand the technology to make sure that we make wise decisions. This seems like a good time to ask you to put yourselves in each other's shoes. Audrey, if you could teach a subject at university and write a book, what subjects would you choose? Well, that's a great question. Um, so I'm actually writing a book. Uh, it's called uh, Plurality.net. Uh, it's uh, a new way of thinking about technology in something that is actually enhancing democracy instead of uh, creating this big gulf between, as Yuval just said, the people who are good at technology and the people who are good at politics, at democracies. I believe that if we think about those pro-social technologies together, then we can actually build a bridge so that collaborative diversity, the ability to systematically generate this kind of bridging narratives and systems can be a shared project between the people who focus on technology on one side and the people who focus on democratic politics on the other side. So I will probably be teaching this plurality that network uh, at a university. Uh, and I think this is really getting a lot of academic uh, support now that we have the plurality institute and so on with a lot of people really focusing on the kind of fabric of trust that can actually survive this interactive defake making AI onslaught. This is probably the most important imminent issue that we need to apply the academic uh, insight on to create a system where we can then use to coordinate on solving other problems caused by the AI. But first, we must not lose our coordination power across countries. What about you? Yuval, what would be your first decision as digital minister? I'm not sure about the first thing, but I, I think, you know, like, like in the health ministry, you have a lot of focus today on food diet, the understanding that the food we take into our bodies, um, long before we have any disease, let's try to look at the food we take into our body. I think it's the same with the information, that we need an information diet to help people and give guidelines to people, also to, to companies, how to, everybody needs an information diet. That we are often so careful about the food we put into our mouths, and we are so careless about the information we feed our minds. Again, we sometimes, you know, for hours, gorge on junk information, or information filled with hatred and, and anger and things like that. So, um, um, I'll, I'll try to have this project to help people uh, be more mindful of the of their food of the information diet, and you know also you know to schools to to, to the market the same the, the same way that you have warnings, you you can sell something with lots of fat and sugar or whatever if people want to buy it, but you have to put a warning on it 
Maybe we need the same thing for, for information, that, okay, you want to watch this video, but just know that it is 40% hatred, 20% greed, and 20% uh, fear. And if now this is what you want to feed your mind, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think nutrition labels uh, for information sources is great. We are, in fact, uh, having a platform in which the journalists, uh, professional journalists in Taiwan are talking to the Facebook and Google uh, nowadays because they also feel that whatever journalism they produce, if uh, they are good for the health of the mind, but not good to, you know, clickbait engagement and things like that, then uh, Facebook and uh, Google simply doesn't give them the platform, right? So they yeah. are now seeking redress, uh, saying that uh, this is like a, a global harm, uh, which is harming the ability for people in the democracy to think, right? Uh, and we already got pretty good uh, answers from Google who want to invest in this co-prosper fund to make sure journalism still function well. But increasingly, I think this is uh, basically a, a essential service for people in a democracy. Like if do, they do not, uh, the largest platform do not agree to contribute substantially to the balanced information diet, including fact uh, journalism, then uh, maybe they should actually uh, just uh, be labeled as such, uh, as in like info hazards, providers, and so on, exactly as uh, how Yuval suggested. Yeah. Yuval, what are your thoughts on this conversation with Audrey? Um, as I said, I, I, feel, I feel more optimistic, uh, seeing that th there is... Again, I, I tend to focus on, on the dangers and the problems and seeing that there is so many good things that we can do to mitigate the problems and to make the best of AI. And, and again, and like I said several times, it has also wonderful potential, which I didn't speak about much because other people are doing it. But if we know how to use it properly, it could be one of the best inventions, maybe the best invention that human beings ever made. It's good to hear that. Do you have any question for each other? Maybe uh, just maybe to, to ask Audrey how, how she manages her own information diet. And if, if you have any, any tips uh, for keeping your mind sharp and clear to, to deal with all these big issues. Sure, uh, and it's uh, quite well known uh, to people in Taiwan. Uh, there's only mm. two things. One is that I always sleep for at least eight hours a day. Uh, and oh. second is that I never touch a touch screen for more than a couple of seconds. I always uh, have this shield of a stylus or a touchpad or a mouse or a keyboard because if I touch mm. the touch screen for more than a few seconds, my brain thinks it's part of me. Uh, and then it would just oh. uh, refuse to to give up the scrolling and things like that. Uh, and so in order to counter this addiction, I simply say, no, I never just touch the screen, except uh, sometimes to zoom things in and zoom things out. But I always treat it as a toxic uh, surface so that I will always oh. uh, keep a distance uh, between me and the screen. Thank you. I, I've never heard that before. And, and I think it's, it's maybe in Taiwan, you know that, but in Israel, in ma ma much of the world, people still haven't realized it. So thank you for, for this. I hope it's one of the ideas that makes sense <laughs> uh, to yeah. counter the incoming challenges uh, that we're all facing. Yeah. We've been talking with Audrey Tang and Professor Yuval Noah Harari about the future of humanity, as well as solutions to make the best out of the digital revolution. We hope you found this conversation informative and engaging. If you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe, share and let us know what you think. See you next time on Innovative Minds. Hello, I'm Professor Yuval Noah Harari, uh, CEO on Taiwan Plus. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister, CEO on Taiwan Plus.